Let's get into AEW Dynamite from May 15th, 2024. I want to give AEW some credit, and I'm going to sprinkle it throughout the show to make sure you're listening. But it, it was Dynamite, so it was what it was in terms of me not really caring about it. But let's get into news and notes. Let's see if we can have some fun here. First, let's talk about Ricky Starks. Our guy, Ricky Starks, man, we ain't seen hide or hair of Ricky Starks. He is in witness protection. But sometimes he crawls out of his hole in order to make comments. And he made some comments that might be a little bit interesting. He says this um, on what culture, I guess he did their podcast or something. He says, it's just very interesting time. I feel like I wish I was on Dynamite. I wish I was on Dynasty. I wish I was on these things, but I think at a certain point, just for my own sanity, I can't go too crazy about it because the proof is in my work and my effort that I've constantly given. I've constantly given a thousand percent effort. So at a certain point, it's not in my control. I think that's the biggest lesson I have. Things are just not in my control. But the things that are, I try the hardest. So it's very unfortunate that he is healthy because he mentioned people thought he was injured. And he went on Twitter and said, not injured, just not being used, not getting the call. And uh, you have to figure out who Cheerios he pissed in because you have a guy that's talented, even if he is small. It's not like this is the WWE and this is Vince McMahon running the place. And you just say, oh, the guy's too tiny and Vince doesn't care. This is AEW. They need a shot in the arm. They need new energy. And Ricky Starks is the guy who could quite possibly help this place. And they insist on giving him their ass to kiss. I don't understand. Maybe it's because of things that he said about CM Punk. Like in later, I'm not going to read it. He talks about Punk being instrumental and um, how he and Punk work together on Collision. And um, he likes punk and doesn't really care if other people don't. And um, he doesn't have any issues with punk. So it seems like to me, you know, the good guy is one and punk left. And pretty much everybody who was a punk favorite, either you had to work with Edge, which, you know, Starks did for a little while. And uh, Malachi Black did, is doing now rather. Or you had to basically sit at home. And it's really unfortunate that Ricky Starks is a healthy scratch. When you look at some of the talent that's being featured on this show, and you think that a guy who can talk and work as well as Ricky Starks is being forced to sit at home. Very, very unfortunate. But that's just the way the cookie crumbles, I guess. Um, the other note that we've got here is that Daniel Cash Wheeler will no longer be facing the gun charge. The prosecution decided to dismiss the case. So Daniel is free to go. He's free to pull his pistol on others. But I kind of figured this was going to happen anyway. Unless they found a gun on him or in his person, um, it was probably going to get tossed. I mean, even if they found a gun, they would have to prove that he was pointing it at somebody. And he probably wouldn't get on the stand and admit to it. It'd be his word versus the word of the other guy and it's a waste of taxpayer money and time. Eh, I really would have liked to be able to read why the prosecution did that. But I would imagine it has something to do with not enough evidence. And, uh, you know, just can't prove the case. But Daniel Wheeler, free as a birdie. Good. Great job. There was an update to the Nyla Rose, Oklahoma State Athletic Commission issue. I guess I'll save that because there's a lot of it to go over. I'll save that for the live stream. So we'll do that. But well, I'll give you a brief summary. Uh, the state of Oklahoma, they have changed administrators. Um, so now there's a new administrator and they might be considering changing the rules to allow trans wrestlers to wrestle. Um, wrestlers of the other sex. Um, I am a proponent of the State Athletic Commission getting out of there and not regulating wrestling at all. But, you know, you, you could take the few victories you can get. But there's far more to it than, than that. 
and I really want to get into it a little bit more. Um, so we'll get into it a little bit more on the live stream and rather than go through this now, but AEW was not fined or suspended or anything. There was nothing more than a warning given to them. And because they have all these political connections and all of this uh, public attention, it becomes a big deal because it happened to an AEW wrestler, which, you know, nothing happened to the company or nothing happened to anybody. It just went on the internet that Oklahoma was like, no, you can't do this. And um, people rallied the troops. So there that goes. So those were the big news and notes that I could scratch up. So nothing major this week. So let's get into this really boring show. Brian Danielson and John Moxley defeat Jeff Cobb and Kyle Fletcher. Do, do you? Why? Why is Why is Jeff Cobb here? I thought bringing in somebody like Jeff Cobb might make him special. You know, you might want to make you know Jeff Cobb mean something. But he's just there. There's no fanfare for him being there. There's no care given. He was was he even promoted? You know, like, like it's like you bring a guy in, and you want to use his reputation to to boost your product, but you don't want to tell us anything about him. You don't want to support him, and you don't want to advertise him. So what the hell was the point? I don't want to put too much thought into it. Jeff Cobb was defeated it well Kyle Fletcher got beat after the match Takeshita attacked John Moxley because he wants that IWGP title and Claudio chased these guys off with a pipe because he's very mad then later on they showed a video of Eddie Kingston being injured in New Japan that he was jumped by the elite but here's the here's the thing that's not what happened he took a suplex off the ring apron and seemingly destroyed his legs because he's a fat idiot. Because he's a fat, turtle-shaped moron who took a stupid bump two weeks before a pay-per-view main event match. I don't well, technically I don't know if it's the main event, but I was, I'm assuming it is. And seemingly injured himself. And they put the heat on the elite, which was smart on their on their part. That was very smart. And uh, Eddie Kingston is out. This is followed up with the elite who says, hey, you guys can fight us four on three or even better. You should forfeit because Dax Harwood would have to wrestle Okada later. And Okada spoke in English and called Dax a biatch. FTR did a promo shortly thereafter said that they're willing to fight 4-3, to three, but they don't need to because they may have already had a fourth person. And then Dax called Okada the elite's bitch. They're calling each other bitches. It's like Megan Thee Stallion and Nicki Minaj or something. The Young Bucks would go on to defeat Christopher Daniels and Matt Seidel in a tag team match that almost put me to sleep. Christopher Daniels looks like a dildo. He looks like a dildo for 25 years. I wonder does Vince McMahon have a Christopher Daniels dildo? The fun part was after the match. I'm going to give AEW some credit. The Young Bucks fired Christopher Daniels from his talent relations job, saying that he should know better than to strike them and get in their face like he did, I believe it was on Collision. Because they're working hard to clear out the toxicity and trying to save this company. They said he got him a really good severance package. He's going to get paid for like the next three months. They also got him a security escort out of the building. Then they asked for the people to give an AEW chant, which they promptly did not do. Then Jack Perry poured an energy drink over the head of Tony Schiavone. That was very extra. The whole bullying of Tony Schiavone was a little much. But Fire and Christopher Daniels, I like that. Um, I wish they had done that before they wrestled him. Like they beat him and then fired him, which was hilarious. But it would have been nice, like, right before the match, they decided, you know what, Chris? You're fired, bro. And made said he'll fight the match by himself. But uh, I got a kick out of them firing him. I don't know. I like that part. <laughs> that part was fun. 
Later on, Dax Harwood was defeated by Kazuchika Okada after Okada kicked him in the nuts and hit him with the Rainmaker. I was very frustrated at this match because it was a solid enough match, um, except for that headbutt spot that they insist on doing, where the guys are down on all fours running their heads into each other. I'm like, that's dumb, and I don't see any need for it. I also want to give AEW some credit for doing that ringside promo. There was a promo that... Uh, Renee Paquette did while she was standing next to the ramp. It was very much like something you would see in a basketball game or UFC or football where you see sometimes these sports reporters and they're right at courtside, right at the sideline, and they're talking and telling you, I talked to so-and-so, you know, two days ago, and this is what they told me, blah, 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 blah. It was a similar thing here. You know, well, Renee supposedly has spoke to Dax and she's relaying what Dax told her just as he's making his interest. So he's walking by as she's talking and everything. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, it reminded me a lot of WWE who used to do that. They used to do it back in the day. But it was also these do commercials during that time, too. They would have like Ted, Todd Pettengill, you know, uh, cutting a promo while Shawn Michaels walked to the ring trying to sell you glasses and gloves. So, but this gave it a really good sports feel. So I want to give them credit for that. That was very good. That was very smart. I can see WWE is probably going to steal it. Uh, during the match, Dax took a hanging DDT on the floor and actually took some time to sell it. So that made the match more interesting. Um, it wasn't close enough to the finish for me, but whatever. After the match, the Elite jumped Dax because everybody gets jumped after the match on this show. And... The four to three numbers game led to the elite kicking everybody's ass until Darby Allen, you know, a, a guy who just got off the bus. Um, he is the fourth man. He saved everybody by attacking people with his skateboard. I can't believe five years in, we're still doing skateboard stuff. The crowd was unglued for Darby because they're in his general area of Washington. And uh, he seemed to be very excited. So Darby Allen, who got hit by a bus, broken foot, is being pulled off the bench to wrestle in his fatal four-way garbage match <clears throat> where he's probably going to aggravate everything that he suffered. And you have to ask the question, like, this guy got hit by a bus like a couple of weeks ago. How well is he really? You know, um, he had a broken foot. That is the reason why he can't climb Mount Everest. That was less than three months ago. How well is he really? Um, it seems like Tony Khan is just kind of like, you're you're still upright and I'm still paying you. So get out there, which is it's just fine by me. I don't fuck with Darby Allen anyway. A little cunt. Anyway, Darby Allen is your fourth man now. The crowd seemed to like it. I don't care. Swerve Strickland, they did a vignette for him where he was talking about being the proud of being the face of the franchise of AEW. And they try to lead us to believe that he's doing um, uh, PR for AEW. I ain't never seen that fool on TV. So they try to act like he was doing, maybe it's local stuff he's doing. But he's very proud of it. They're interspersing this with uh, threats and stuff from Christian Cage. And um, they're setting the stage for his match with uh, Brian Cage later. So he cut a promo saying that uh, the Mogul Embassy was a chapter of his life that ended on collision when he uh, handled the Toa Leona and Khan issue. And this is where he basically just beat the tar out of both of these guys. And I think he gave one of them a concerto. And basically he just, you know, beat him up, generally beat him up on collision. So if you didn't watch collision, you didn't see it. And thankfully, I probably was sitting there on my exercise bike or something like that while this was going on. He said defeating Brian Cage will be the final nail in this coffin. He's going to work, welcome Cage to Swerve's house. And clearly, Brian Cage lost because when does he win ever? It's hard to buy this guy as a threat when he just lost to like random wrestler X three weeks ago. And there's been no wins or change of direction or anything since then. Brian Cage is a bum. All right. He's a bum. Um, he's just a big old bum. Swerve Strickland uh, defeats Brian Cage and then attacked him with a chair after the match. Hit him right in the meaty part of his shoulder. 
Christian Cage's theme played. It took him forever to come out, but that was just a distraction. So Nick Wayne could hit Swerve Strickland in a ball sack, and he got jumped because everybody gets jumped after the match on this show. That's just what they do. But then they did something that I actually like. Swerve Strickland got was bound by Nick Wayne. He was oh well, I'm sorry by Christian and Luchasaurus, and Nick Wayne got a picture, a photo of Swerve Strickland's family, and then he crashed it over Swerve's head and busted his head open. I like that. Christian then cut a promo and asked if Swerve's daughter was proud of her absentee father, and rubbed his face in the blood in the picture. So he had the picture, he rubbed his face in it. It was good. This was I like that angle. I like the, that Christian sticks to the family angle. He makes it personal every single time. I like this. I like that angle. I just wish that we didn't just do the family angle right before this. Right before this. Malachi Black comes out there. Um, they attack Edge. They beat Edge up, roll him all to the ring. They're kicking his ass. Uh, Malachi is about to talk. The crowd starts chanting, shut the fuck up. And he promptly cuts off his promo and just says, forget it. Take his wedding ring. So Brody King and Buddy Matthews, after they choke Edge almost to death, they take his wedding ring off. And Malachi Black put the wedding ring in his pocket. And uh, then they continue kicking his ass and gave him this like a triple corner attack or whatever where there's like chairs on each side and nothing in the middle. And they all hit each other at the same time to leave ledge laid all out. Um, Malachi Black, what he was going to say is that all of this stuff is a facade that he's not this person for real. And who he really is, is, um, is going to be revealed. So later on, Malachi Black cut a promo. This time he didn't get shouted down because it was a pre-tape backstage. And he had Edge's wedding ring and then said that everything that's been holding Edge back is symbolized by this wedding ring, this trinket, as he calls it. And he says, of course, I accept your challenge to a barbed wire steel cage match. And I was like, wait a minute, where the hell did, did where this a challenge made? <laughs> like, OK, all right. Um, then he says that when he wins, when he becomes victorious, he wants Edge to kneel to the House of Black. And I like this angle, too. I like the taking of the wedding ring. Only problem I have with it is they did two very deeply personal family angles in the same two hours. All right. I just feel like, OK, you got the symbolism of Swerve with the daughter you also got the symbolism of Edge and the wedding ring and how it softened him. And you got Malachi Black who took it. So now Edge's going to have to fight him to get it back. I like that. Edge gains something by winning. He gets to take his wedding ring back. Similar to when guys used to take like Kurt Angle's gold medals or something like that. This is something that means a lot to him. It represents who he is now. Malachi Black wants who he was. And so... This is an interesting story. The crowd is already shitting all over it, but they don't want no long soliloquies from Malachi Black. <laughs> I found that entertaining. That was very entertaining. So I like the edge angle. I like the Christian angle. Uh, Swerve Strickland gets beat up every week. I'm not sure I like that, though. Um, I don't think they know how to book anybody in AEW. I have I watched people rant and rave about Swerve Strickland. Your boy, um, Big Nasty, did like a 10 minute video about, you know, full of like Kendrick Lamar and Drake references. It was so annoying. Oh, I wanted to just puke. Jesus. Ugh. anyway, I choked that video down uh, ver ver visually, of course. Pause. Um, and. Basically, he made the, the, the point that Swerve is a really poorly booked champion because you have competing world champions and you have this overarching story with uh, the elite. So he's not the most important thing on the show. He's not the most important player. 
And everybody has the the belief and the feel that everything he does is sort of middling until he wrestles Will Ospreay and loses the title because that's pretty much what everybody thinks. And AEW has not done a good job of taking you off that trail. And I think that even though the video was terrible, some of the points made sense. All right. Um, and Swerve Strickland is not very well booked as world champion. I mean, he is the world champion. He's been beat up every week, which is usually not the worst thing in the world because you do need sympathy. The problem is when he makes his big comeback, you don't really see it. This is the thing about when he attacked Khan and Toa Leona and those, and those guys, it was on collision. And who the hell watches collision? You know, outside of the very small niche audience. So if you only watch Dynamite, you maybe you did, did they even or they might have shown clips of him attacking those guys on Collision, but they should have done it on Dynamite. Leading up to this match, you had enough time to show the three of them backstage coming to the ring together or whatever, and then throughout the night, Swerve was attacking one every one of them one at a time until it's nothing but Brian Cage by himself, and then he beats the shit out of Brian Cage too and wins. Um, I think it should be. On your television show, he should look like a hero sometimes. You know, if you want to have the numbers overwhelm him and take him down, sure. But he should look like a badass sometimes, man. Um, I understand that you're trying to give him somewhat of a redemption arc for all the horrible shit that he did. I understand that too. Um, but you can do that while also not making him bleed and putting him through tables pretty much every week. You know, like you can, you can uh, it doesn't have to be he looks like complete and total shit every week it's just not necessary and I, I never intend to watch another big nasty video again that guy's fucking annoying he's been annoying me for a long time he's an annoying guy that guy sucks um moving on uh well we got tony storm next uh yeah tony storm tony storm cut a promo said that her ovaries must be heard and she was in her bag on this promo half the shit i didn't even understand what she was saying but i liked it i like the cut of her jib um, she's no longer our cherry lip paw guy to see something more now, but I, I really like Tony Storm. She thanked Serena D for knocking her out. So she didn't have to listen to any more of her bullshit sob story. <laughs> that was a nice turn right there. You knocked me out. So I didn't have to listen to you, which is great. Um, also for this match that she's going to wrestle, everybody was banned from ringside and she was actually kind of perturbed by that. Like it matters. Tony Storm defeated Harley Cameron. And that was like two weeks in a row. Harley Cameron's on this show. I don't know, man. I mean, what got into Tony Khan that he's featuring hot chicks? I'm not so sure about Harley Cameron wrestling, but she's hot. Uh, Storm wins, of course, with um, Storm Zero. And Serena D was watching and smiling. Um, okay. Whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Tony Storm. Uh... I love Tony Storm. I love me some Tony Storm. She's great. That girl's that girl good. Harley Cameron. I don't know. I don't know what you can do with her. Next, uh, Hook defeated some kind of Jabarello in like a real quick fashion. He didn't call out Chris Jericho. He wants his title back. Jericho comes out there. Hey guys. Hi guys. Smiling and waving, and people are buying into it. Some people are buying into this Jericho shit. You know, he says it's great to have Hook back. You know, it says that he, he wants to share the spotlight with Hook. Hook doesn't want to share the spotlight with him. He wants the spotlight to only be on Chris Jericho as he kicks Chris Jericho's ass. The crowd is chanting, please retire at Jericho as Jericho is trying to talk. Jericho says he doesn't, you don't want him to retire. He doesn't want to retire. He's going to go into every Hall of Fame. He's going to be everywhere anyway. He's not ready for that yet. And so he went back into character to say that this is not a fighting moment, Hook. And he stopped just short of saying teachable moment. He said this is a teaching moment. And then he says he wants Hook to learn not to be selfish. That he's got to earn his opportunities. And maybe if he wins a qualifying match, he will wrestle him for the world championship. Um, then... It, Hook had something else smart to say, but he ended up stabbing Jericho in the head with the microphone. 
It took Big Bill way too long to respond after Jericho got stabbed in the dome piece. <laughs> he sure did stab him in the head, though. He stabbed him hard, too. Jericho started bleeding. He stabbed him so hard in the head with that microphone. Jericho and Big Bill beat the hell out of Hook. And then Shibata came out there and made the save. Later, Hook is backstage. He's pretty upset. Says, the, you know, the eyes don't mean nothing to him. He wants to fight Jericho. He's going to beat anybody to do it. Shibata is standing there with his phone that he doesn't speak into or type into. It's like the phone is just like connected to his brain. So when his brain was removed, there was like nanotech put into his brain that, you know, sends signals directly to his phone. So the phone knows what he's thinking. And then the phone can just read his mind and just say stuff. But why would his thoughts be in the female voice? Like, why would that? Hmm. Hmm. Why would that be? In any event, Shibata wants to fight Jericho too. Hook and Shibata are basically nose to nose, thinking they have to go through one another to get to Chris Jericho. And then here comes Samoa Joe, who's talking about, hey, I saw something in Hook. Now he's disappointing me. He's got, he's all up in Shibata's face. What are you doing? You got to get your life together. You're playing yourself. And then he leaves. But he was wearing uh, an incredibly loud shirt. Shibata then, the, his vocal thing, his, his brain uh, machine says, he is way too large to be wearing a floral pattern. And I popped. I popped because I was thinking the same damn thing. Maybe that thing is connected to my brain. I was like, what in the hell? He's walking around here with Mother's Day all over his chest and back and stuff. What is who dressed Samoa Joe? Is Grandma? This is what is Samoa Joe a babyface or a heel? I mean, he got built like a pit bull, and he's running around here in that shirt. <laughs> it's hilarious, big pop, and it was almost like a babyface promo from Joe too. Like you know, um, he he liked. Hook and he had Hook had all this potential and everything, but Hook's distracted and you know all this shit. Eh, I like the I like the joke. The joke popped me. Jericho, everybody hates Jericho. I'm just kind of like he 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 hasn't sunk to the point where I hate him. He's just sunk to the point where I don't really pay that close attention to what he does anymore. He's doing laps, you know, just for fun. He's not out there actually uh, doing anything of note anymore, you know, as far as I'm concerned. He's not taken away from the product, but he's not really adding to the product either. Um, I definitely think Hook should have been moving forward. It's about time for him to make his own legacy and leave that goddamn FTW title alone. But I would have to get into the writer's room and say... Hey, how about Hook actually, you know, forging his own legacy and not just living off of Taz? I know you guys think that's all, you know, Cody Rose does. But if that was the case, you would most certainly not want Hook to do that. I mean, it's been four years already, you know. Come on. It's time to start branching out and doing other things, right? We got another promo segment. Will Ospreay and Roderick Strong. Will Ospreay said the world's eyes are on him and that Roderick Strong is too comfortable around him with that title and that uh, maybe he should unretire the Tiger Driver 97 so that he'll be a little bit more respectful. Then he always said that he never got the respect he deserved from Roderick Strong. And even back in, you know, Japan, even back in Ring of Honor, Roderick Strong always buried him. He never respected him. Strong agreed that he never respected him, said that he never respected him because he was an idiot outside the ring, that he doesn't deserve this title. He doesn't deserve a title match. And says that he knows who Will Ospreay is, and Will Ospreay is a fraud. And all of this felt very manufactured, very microwaved, because, well, for starters, I don't like anything that's out inside baseball. I don't need to know Ring of Honor history from 15 years ago. I, come on. It's completely different when it's WWE history and we just and we just saw it or at the very least is something that is contained within this company. When you're talking, you're telling me to remember storylines or ideas or whatever real life locker room gossip from Ring of Honor from over a decade ago. What kind of nerd do you take me for? 
do you take me for some hairy bastard that don't get pussy? Like, that would be, like, the only way I would know. This is not heat to me. I don't care about this. You used to bury me to the locker room. I'm like, shit, I bury you to the locker room. You're a dork. Who has Power Ranger fight scene matches? I would bury you too. Shit. <laughs> Do better. This sucks. Mercedes Monet and Willow Nightingale. They had a promo segment. Now, let me tell you guys, I am going to the church of Willow Nightingale. That girl good. She cut one hell of a promo. She promotes circles around Mercedes here. She cut this promo by talking about the title and the legacy of the title and what it means and what it represents and how she is the face of TBS now. And that on her Titan Tron, which I know a lot of people are like, Titan Tron, because Titan Tron comes from Titan, Titan Sports, WWE. It's like when they used to call it a gorilla position and then they tried to call it the go position. Okay, you get what I'm saying, right? But she says on her Titan Tron, it's you know it's about smiling and about you know happiness or whatever. She talks about her smile being her strength, and she finds something to smile about. And she says that she is not going to let Mercedes Monet walk into AEW and take that away, her smile or her championship. And I was, I I was paying attention. I was locked in because Mercedes. Ain't talking about shit, but Willow, she she made it personal, and she added a little bit of the importance of the title. She also talked about how much she respected Mercedes, but she wasn't going to be a pushover. She was going to stand up for herself. She knows what's going on here, but Mercedes now, and the crowd just did the work for them. They turned Mercedes heel. The crowd just said, look, boo, from the jump. Soon as she started talking, boo, and she just went on with it. You know, she talked about money changing everything, how she changed the game. And while, you know, you were doing blah, 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 I was breaking barriers and cracking through the glass ceiling. You know, you wouldn't even be here without me. You know, so she, I'm going to show you the difference between being great and being the greatest of all time and that she is the new face of TBS because the red carpets, courtside at the game, throwing out the first pitch at baseball games, that's what the face of the company should do. And it, at, her promo actually fit more as a heel, like you know people have been saying. Mercedes, of course, continues talking about how she's the trendsetter, she's this, she's that. And Willow says, the last time we wrestled, I walked out a champion. You didn't walk out at all. And so Mercedes smacked her in the face. So Willow powerbombed that bitch through a table. And I was like, hell fucking yeah. And the crowd popped. I popped. I like this segment. It felt natural. Mercedes still is not a great promo, but her fake laughing, her talking about money and celebrity and all this kind of stuff is a great counterpoint to the more grassroots feel of the Willow Nightingale's character. Um, this is typically how it ends up with WWE talent and AEW original talents. They almost always end up with the, you're more famous, but I have more heart. You know, I have more drive. I have more ambition. You are just like a celebrity coming in, taking something that you didn't earn or you're resting on your laurels or something like that. They basically did the same thing here. It's that Willow cut a really strong promo and she was very believable and she's very likable. And Mercedes is not likable. She's very fake. So it fits. Willow is real. Mercedes is fake. Willow is, you know, blue collar. Uh, Mercedes is white collar. You know, Mercedes is almost like I've already been where you've been. I've already paid, laid the path for you. You know, you'll never be on my level. And Willow's like, I'm working hard. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to make my own way. I'm going to find my own reason to smile every day. And that's really great shit. Good shit. This is a great segment. My only issue, if I have to criticize it, it would be this should have been on the go home show. That's my only thing that I have to say. They should have did this the week of the pay-per-view. So now we have to carry this throughout another week. 
which means probably more promos from these girls that are not going to be as strong as the ones they did on this show. So that's that. So Dynamite was boring as usual, but there was some stuff in it that was okay. I liked the wedding ring uh, being taken. I liked the photo. I liked, you know, Willow's promo. Darby Allen being the replacement for Eddie Kingston, that fat slob, was fine. Uh, but the matches I was not interested in. Stories I'm not really all that interested in. So, I mean, it's it's a typical Dynamite, for God's sake. What more can you say? Well, let me know what you guys think in the comment section below, and I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.